This lesson is going to cover the Johnson administration. Lyndon B. Johnson is an incredibly interesting character. He is someone who is known as this close talker, as you can see here, a rather intimidating figure. Uh, he becomes president right after John F. Kennedy is assassinated in 1963. He wins the election in 1964, and then he bows out um, and ends his presidency and doesn't run in 1968. And we'll discuss why. So let's get ready for John F. Oops, Lyndon Baines Johnson. The main focus of the Johnson administration is the Great Society, and this is Johnson's incredibly ambitious program uh, to end poverty, and it's multifaceted. This war on poverty is about civil rights, it's about educating the youth, it's about, about providing health care uh, to the poor and to the elderly, it's about expanding culture through the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities. And Johnson basically viewed it as the federal government's responsibility to take on this war on poverty by making sure that everyone had an equal opportunity for jobs uh, or job training, um, equal opportunity for pay, equal opportunity to get a house or a home loan, uh, encouraging these young volunteers, these you know uh, teenagers, these new baby boomers who are graduating from um, college or who are in high school to go into the inner city and teach preschool, to teach kindergarten, to clean up the city. Uh, this is also about civil rights. Let's ensure that people have equal access to jobs, to voting, get rid of poll taxes, literacy tests. Again, with the 1968 Civil Rights Act, let's make sure that everyone has a fair shot at getting a house or buying a house, selling or renting. Health is also a major concern for the Great Society. Uh, the population is living longer and they're getting older and they're retiring. And when these individuals are retiring, they don't have access to a lot of health care. And this could be quite financially draining on them or their middle class children. And so Medicare was created in order to subsidize health care for the people who are 65 and older, whereas Medicaid was created to subsidize health care uh, for people who cannot afford health care. Now back to education. Again, part of this great society is let's start young. Let's have free preschool. Let's build schools in inner city neighborhoods. And let's have the federal government be in charge through the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, giving money to the states. And so this really connects a really good uh, example of federalism, of the states and federal government working together to talk about education. One thing I really like about the Great Society is culture. It's creating the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. This is creating P PBS. This is giving money to uh, museums. And it's something that can benefit everybody. Now, Johnson's plan was incredibly ambitious. Uh, as you can see in this quote here, he says that the challenges of the next half century is whether we have the wisdom to use our wealth and uh, enrich and elevate our national life and to advance the quality of our American civilization. In the first part of the 20th century, uh, we did have the Great Depression. We had World War One and World War II. But by 1964, our country is pretty booming. And Johnson really looks to that success to build up this great society by expanding liberty and dealing with civil rights and making sure that education is also a focus. And this is something that was incredibly controversial, though. In fact, you see a lot of challenges to the Great Society. Number one, a lot of businesses were not too happy with some of the environmental regulations, uh, like the Water and Air Act. A lot of industries like oil and steel found this incredibly burdensome. You have states like Birmingham, Alabama, uh, really was a uh, post-Civil War city that really built up based on the steel industry. And by the 1970s, with the Water and Air Act, as well as additional standards that Nixon is going to set on clean water and clean air, uh, it's just going to um, really kind of shrink the city. Other issues and other critics 
argue that it creates a culture of dependency. And this is the same type of criticism that FDR received during the New Deal. People are relying on the federal government to get a job or to get a loan or to regulate business. So you start to have this big debate of, is it the government's responsibility or at least the federal government's responsibility to ensure these things to the population? In the election of 1964, you have Republican Barry Goldwater, who argues that the Great Society is too costly and it gives the federal government too much power. And this is really interesting in 1964, as people are debating when it comes to civil rights. They might say, yes, I am for um, equality and I am against segregation, but if this business choose to operate this way, what should I do as as the government? You start to have this debate in the 1960s and then it extends uh, with the New Deal. However, the Great Society, their biggest challenge to have the Great Society is this, the Vietnam War is going to come front and center at the end of 1964 and into 1965. And Johnson's hope of having a successful Great Society is going to go away specifically because you can't really fund a war and a great society at the same exact time. And hopefully you see this in these political cartoons here. Uh, Here you have Johnson, uh, characteristic with a large nose and a strong widow peak, uh, really taking the sword of war costs and sadly chopping off the head of the great society hopes now he does this inadvertently he does not mean to his back essentially is turned on the great society uh, and this really crushes the great society based on this cartoon he's not trying to crush the great society on purpose however if you look at this other cartoon as you notice they're both done by the same cartoonist or block uh, the johnson administration again look at the nose look at the widow's peak is making it clear that he is choosing this lady over here, the Vietnam War, giving her all of the missiles and all of the guns and the tanks uh, and really leaving the U.S. urban needs really sad and left alone. So uh, they both have the same type of attitude of Johnson prioritizing the Vietnam War over the Great Society, but in this cartoon here, he's doing it inadvertently, and on this, he's basically looking at uh, the Great Society in the face and saying, I'm sorry, my dear, not going to fund you right now. So let's erase uh, those markings right now and really jump into the Vietnam War. Shortly into Johnson's administration, uh, the Vietnam War starts. So previously in Vietnam, just a super, super, super quick recap of what is happening uh, and what happened in the Eisenhower and um, Kennedy administrations in the war. Uh, Vietnam was led by communist Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh, hopefully you remember, uh, and right after World War I had wrote um, Woodrow Wilson and said, hey, Woodrow, can you help me gain independence? I really like what you're doing with uh, the 14 points. Woodrow Wilson said, I'm sorry, my man, Ho Chi Minh, I'm out. Like, I'm not going to be president anymore. We're going to be isolationist, isolationists in the 1920s. Sorry. Um, the French regained or maintained control in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the Vietnamese lost control and the French lost control during World War II when Japan came in. When Japan was shoved out because they lost World War II, that's when France says, oh, bonjour, my friends, I am taking you over again. And Ho Chi Minh was not happy about that. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh fought a war 1946 to 1954. Spoiler alert, France loses. I know that's shocking. Uh, By 1954, Eisenhower is president and the Geneva Conference, uh, 18 world powers meet together and they say, hey, let's split Vietnam in half because that's what they do at this time. Vietnam split, uh, Korea is split, uh, Berlin is split, Germany is split, and we'll have Ho Chi Minh ruling in the north, and then we'll have Neo Dim ruling in the south. Uh, And these two figures definitely contrast each other. Um, Ho Chi Minh is seen as a man of the people. He's seen basically as the George Washington of Vietnam. Neo Dim was educated in France. He was seen as a European sympathizer. And his administration, despite being an ally with America, is plagued by corruption um, and really anti-Buddhists. Uh, Buddhism. 
1956, we were supposed to have elections to unify the two countries. However, when it was clear that Ho Chi Minh right here would win, that's when the world said, oh, no, let's split it. Let's keep it split. <laughs> let's keep it remain split. Maybe eventually we can uh, pull it together when Ho Chi Minh leaves. Uh, but during this time, Eisenhower and Kennedy sent in military advisors to Vietnam. Uh, and they do this because, number one, Diem is massively corrupt and monks are self-emulating. Um, you can see this here in this really famous um, photograph with this monk sitting in the lotus position straight up right after he had doused himself with gasoline, light himself on fire in protest of Neo Diem, which is the guy that America is supporting. So a lot of Americans have a hard time really understanding who they're supposed to be against. But uh, by the time we get into 1963, uh, it's really clear with the American people that Neo Dim, he, he has to go. Um, here are some documents from the Pentagon Papers uh, that were a secret cache of documents that were released uh, in the 1970s. Get to that next unit. Um, and in these documents, it basically illustrates that, yeah, there was a military coup against Neo Dim. It definitely resulted in his death and America is a little responsible. Uh, sometimes because we authorized specific military action, we encouraged it, but we also did nothing when we heard that there was going to be a military coup. We basically left Neo Dim high and dry. Um, he was killed in this military coup. And once that has happened, America and the American CIA says, okay, we can start afresh um, and we can get this under control. However, um, it really does not ever get under control. In fact, when Neo Dim is killed in this military coup, communist radios um, in China, in um, North Vietnam, in the Soviet Union, they use this as propaganda, saying that this was organized against America because of our repeated military failures in Vietnam. Uh, and that was something that at the time we really had a hard time denying. So this leads us up to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and this is a really important event in history. Uh, basically, I have this map here, so you can see just how close China is to Vietnam. China is basically whispering in Ho Chi Minh's ear the whole time, and of course, like right above China, you have further up uh, the Soviet Union. So uh, we have it split generally right around here. And we have all of these military advisors in South Vietnam. And they're patrolling, just you know, making sure that you don't have too many communists going down here. Uh, and the Americans wind their way up here in the Gulf of Tonkin. And at this time, um, some North Vietnamese gunboats fired on two U.S. destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, no casualties. It was uh, generally superficial when it came to damage, but it was definitely something that America saw as an aggressive move. In addition to that, it is something that Johnson and his administration painted as a very aggressive move. Two days later, President Johnson says, hey, we have another unprovoked attack from the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA, and Johnson ordered American aircraft to attack North Vietnamese ships and naval facilities. Now, when this happened, a lot of people in America say, yay because we are against communism. We're really scared that it's going to spread. And if we do nothing about this, this is just going to up the power of the Soviet Union and China, and we cannot let this happen. Uh, so at the very beginning, a lot of Americans are really supportive of um, this plan. And the plan's a very loose plan at best. In fact, um, right after this, you have the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, and this authorizes the president to, quote, take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. Wow, that is pretty much a blank check. You look at this here, take all necessary measures, all necessary measures, which means if President Johnson wants to send a million water balloons to North Vietnam, he can or if he wants to send 500,000 troops drafting them to Vietnam, he can, which is why in Vietnam, 
it's never officially a war. In fact, it's considered a conflict, and that's because Congress never declares war. Instead, they just give Johnson this authority to take all necessary measures. And you're going to see that the Johnson administration quickly takes this power and escalates um, American involvement in Vietnam. Uh, 1964, of course, is an election year, and uh, Johnson is running in November of 1964. So this is just a few months after the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And he runs this really famous campaign commercial. From the, From the Library, Library of Congress, Congress in Washington, in Washington DC. DC. each other or we must die vote for president johnson on november 3rd the stakes are too high for you to stay home yeah so that was a pretty um aggressive campaign commercial the stakes are too high you have the really darling girl who is miscounting the petals and then it escalates rather quickly which is actually going to be a very appropriate theme for vietnam it is going to escalate rather quickly so first let's just talk about who this enemy is as I had talked about before, Ho Chi Minh is leader of the North. I'm going to mention this as the NVA several times, the North Vietnamese Army. Uh, not surprising, the Soviet Union and Russia are their main allies. And these are determined fighters. Um, they successfully fought against the French. These are people from generation after generation, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and now in the 60s, are really determined to get their independence. Now, we also have another side to worry about. And this other side we're worrying about is the Viet Cong. Um, they're also known as the National Liberation Front. Now, these are people who are generally in the South. Um, they have a, also a few names to them, VC, Victor Charlie, Charlie. Um, and these are individuals who are fighting against America and South Vietnamese forces. Um, the North Vietnamese is their ally, and they use guerrilla warfare. They're farmers by day, they're VC by night. Uh, they are women, uh, they are children, and basically ooh, these the two things that these groups, these enemies have in common is that they're fighting against the South Vietnamese and the American forces. So let's clear that off, and you can see Ho Chi Minh here, and a VC, and this VC um, over here, you can see he has his hand out. He's looking, questioning, like, what's what's the matter? Why are you taking me? I'm one of your friends. Uh, and that becomes a really hard thing in the war to determine who the enemy actually is. So let's talk about our geographic scope. So China. China over here um, is a main ally of the of the North Vietnamese and they are really going to help out um, Ho Chi Minh in North Vietnam. Uh, North Vietnam, communist country created after the Geneva Accords. Laos, communist and democratic forces use Laos to disrupt supply lines. Uh, Cambodia, similar to Laos, so you can see here Laos and Cambodia, uh, both had their own civil war at this time. And this is because a lot of the chaos of splitting North Vietnam and South Vietnam in the 1950s really spread into Laos and Cambodia. In addition, when China became communist, a lot of those uh, communist forces and idea and propaganda spread to Laos and Cambodia. So in both of these countries here, you have civil war of communist forces and a little bit more democratic forces, or at least 
anti-communist forces kind of struggling against each other. And in addition to this, in order to, for uh, Ho Chi Minh to smuggle supplies into South Vietnam, he is going to invade these two countries here, just escalating the disruption and widening this geographic war. So um, let's talk more about the characteristics of the Viet Cong. Like I had mentioned earlier, you know, his hands are out. He looks incredibly confused. And it's really sad from both of this guy and this guy's perspectives um, because he uh, over here is obviously scared of him. He over here is obviously scared of him. And it's really hard to tell because the VC, they dress in civilian clothes. They're men and women and children at times. They blend in with the South Vietnamese population. Uh, they don't do a lot of day attacks. And this is really important because it's hard to win if you don't know who the enemy is. Uh, it's wonderful during the Revolutionary War when all of the British are lining up in their red coats and we can clearly see them and say, you're the bad guy. At this time, this becomes hard to win a war when the Americans and the South Vietnamese don't know who the enemy is. And you can see that here um, in these pictures, right? Is this the enemy? Is he our friend? Um, is he the enemy? Is he our friend? And when this becomes a war fought basically in Americans' living rooms and they're looking at pictures like this on the television, they don't know who the clear enemy is. There isn't some big Nazi swastika. There isn't some great big red coat. There isn't some you know point at the end of a German helmet uh, indicating who the enemy is. And despite the fact, I really like this cartoon, because despite the fact that America has the H-bomb, we have atomic bombs, and we have this big, mighty Texan in um, Johnson, it's the guerrilla warfare, right? It's the sneak attacks, the blending in with the environment that's really going to psychologically uh, morale uh, deepening and also just physically attacking America that's really going to be hard to reckon with. Uh, I do want to show you, because when it comes to the Vietnam War, it becomes complicated. A lot of these veterans are going to return home uh, to news reports about women and children dying, which we'll get into on the Nixon lecture. And the veterans are not going to be welcomed home, um, specifically because of the killing of the women and children. But you can see in this primary source here, I met this girl in a village store. She was about 17 or 18, sort of pretty and very shy. I found she was studying English and math. I said I could help her in both subjects, and twice we took a short walk to the end of the village. She was afraid of me at the beginning, but later she got over it, and I started to look forward to being with her. One day, we were on this patrol, it was raining, and suddenly we were caught in an ambush. Our guns returned to the fire, we hit them hard, and then called in the gunships for support. And then maybe 30 minutes after, the firing stopped, and we moved out to look for the wounded and to take a body count. There was a bunch of bodies around, all VC, and all were women. One of them was my little girlfriend, now dead, bullets through her head and chest, and she had an automatic near her. I was shocked, she was a VC. Again, you don't really know. And how do you prepare for that, um, that type of training? On the other side, from this same source here, um, you have the exact opposite experience where an American soldier killed somebody that shouldn't have been killed. Uh, to quote, we were outside on an 18-man patrol with 15 ARVNs. Our orders were to move ahead and not hesitate to shoot at anything suspicious, and not hesitate to shoot. And those are probably orders directly from the commanding officer. And some commanding officers are going to get in trouble in this war because they give these orders. And it's hard to draw the line between somebody that's a perceived enemy and somebody that isn't. Um, in the 1960s, is a woman a perceived enemy? What age is a man a perceived enemy? 13, 12, 10, 18? So to continue, we were about 10 kilometers from town when there was some shooting. It lasted 10 minutes. My God, how I remember that damn day. Hot and sticky. The mosquitoes were driving me crazy. And this is also key, right? We're fighting jungle warfare here. And that's also going to be a, a shock to the American soldiers. And there was this little boy, about eight or nine, and he was climbing out of a tree. I grabbed him and blurted out in Vietnamese what little I knew. Who are you and what are you doing here? 
He was afraid of me and pulled away. He had his hand open behind his back like he was hiding something. Grab him, someone screamed. He's got something. I made a move for him and his hand moved again. Shoot. Because of my training, because I was afraid, and this was the first enemy I had come across, I fired at him again and again until I emptied my whole M2 carbine at him. When I looked again, he was cut in two with guts all around and I vomited. I wasn't told, I wasn't trained for that. I was out and out murder. I can never forgive myself and I can never forget it. They're the enemy, but they're fighting for their country. Then I told my psychiatrist and the Catholic chaplain and they said I was only doing my duty. And so that essentially becomes incredibly hard. What is doing your duty? When your commanding officer tells you to fire, do you fire? Or do you just follow orders? Um, if you don't fire, you could. it could be the result of the death of many of your men. And are you okay with that? So this becomes really difficult. In fact, the Johnson administration really wanted to avoid a ground war. Um, and they did so by planning Operation Rolling Thunder. And they started this in March of 1965. So super early into this war and their whole idea is to bomb all of this infrastructure the bridges the rail yards the docks the barracks and hopefully this will lead to the collapse of the vc and also uh north vietnam so all of these airstrikes are happening in north vietnam some of them do go into cambodia and laos and that's going to be a major part of the war, specifically since Johnson and Nixon are both going to adamantly deny ever bombing Cambodia and Laos, but evidence does point to the contrary. So uh, the American military says, let's drop all of these bombs, cluster bombs, which are basically these bombs that have bombs and shrapnel inside of them, and they're scattering all over Southeast Asia, throughout North Vietnam, sometimes into South Vietnam, um, in Cambodia, in Laos, and the effect, though, is it strengthens North Vietnam's and the Viet Cong's determination. So we had hoped that Operation Rolling Thunder would prevent ground troops and it would shorten the war, but it actually had the exact opposite effect. So let's just have some quick statistics on Rolling Thunder. 864,000 tons of American bombs are dropped, $500 million in total damage in just North Vietnam alone, over 52,000 casualties, 30,000 casualties were civilians. And by the way, that number is still climbing. A lot of these cluster bombs are really small. They're about the size of your fist. A lot of them were just scattered. I'm just gonna quickly go up to this image here. You can see like here and here all over the place. A lot of these bombs uh, scattered into the forest and into the countryside and they have yet to explode. In fact, we have um, kids um, and civilians who are uh, losing their limb or losing their life because of these undetonated cluster bombs from you know, 60 years ago. Uh, so let's talk about some statistics from the American Air Force. 745 crew members were shot down, 145 were rescued, 255 were killed, 222 were captured, and 123 were missing. Um, it was very dangerous to be a pilot um, in Vietnam at this time. And as I had mentioned two slides before, it wasn't successful. Uh, you do have the Operation Rolling Thunder lasting three years, way longer than it ever was meant to last. But again, the whole goal was to prevent ground troops. Uh, by 1964, um, you have a ton of South Vietnamese fighting this war and not as many Americans. You have a few Australians, Filipino, South Korean, and uh, Kiwis. But uh, this is going to quickly escalate over here, specifically because of this blank check. Again, Johnson with the nose, Johnson with the widow's peak. And uh, you have General with, uh, Westmoreland, who is constantly saying, Johnson, I need more troops. I need more troops. And he does oblige by supplying more troops. Uh, how does he supply more troops? Through the draft. 
so initially, Johnson says, oh, I'll just need 17,000 young men a month, which seems like a huge number, but it's not that large compared to it escalating to 35,000 35, troops a month. Now, prior to 1969, so during the Johnson administration, the local draft board received their numbers and said, okay, your local draft board needs to call up 1,000 men. Um, in this month or a thousand men in this quarter. And the local draft board would then get all of the young men who qualified. Uh, typically it was 18 to 25 uh, unmarried men. And then they would whittle it down from there and say, okay, you're married, you can be exempt. Okay, you have children, you could be exempt. Uh, later on, there's going to be a changing of restrictions and it's you can have a deferment or an exemption, but if you're married, you can get drafted. If you have children, you can't get drafted. So how you could dodge the draft, you could defer. Young men uh, were called for the draft and they could say, hey, I'm in college. Or you could say, I am a nuclear physicist who's vital to the war effort. You know, some really important job and you could defer. Something really controversial though is the exemption. A doctor could exempt you from the draft if you were too tall, too short, or had bone spurs or flat feet. My father-in-law dodged the draft because he was exempted. Uh, he was 18 and he was six foot two. And the military said, you're too tall because he couldn't fit in the planes. He couldn't fit in the uniforms. He was just too tall. And then as the escalation increases and Johnson calls for more troops, they change the requirements and say, okay, all men six foot four and under. By the time Johnson changes that, guess what? He had grown to six foot five. Next year, they need more men. So they say, okay, all six foot five men and up. He had grown to six foot six. And this happens for a very long time until my father-in-law ends up being six foot nine. And so he is able to not fight in the Vietnam War because he is six foot nine. But a lot of people uh, use the bone spurs, the flat feet, and uh, there's still some controversy about that even today. Uh, President Donald Trump is famous for uh, not fighting in the war. Uh, here you can see the large record of his draft record, and then you can see his draft record pulled up. Uh, and then you can see all of these different classifications by date. So um, he was in college at a time, so he could be exempt. And then he ended up having a 4F exemption um, due to bone spurs in his feet. And in the election of 2016, it became a real controversial issue with, you know, did you dodge the draft? Did you not? So uh, the call for troops and the stalemate. So by the end of 1965, more than 180,000 American combat troops are called in to fight. 180,000. And they're fighting in Vietnam. Uh, and now they have two individuals that they're fighting, not just the NVA, but they have to fight the Viet Cong. So they're fighting the Vietnamese in the north and they're fighting the Vietnamese in the south. And a lot of people are curious, well, who is the enemy then? Again, it's the VC who are using these ambushes, booby traps, blending in with the population, these night attacks that are really uh, making it hard for America to even tackle the North Vietnamese, let alone the South Vietnamese. Uh, the North Vietnamese, uh, Ho Chi Minh saw this and said, yay, thank you, VC, and started sending them troops and supplies through this Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I'll show you a map of in just a little bit. So to counter this, like I had mentioned earlier, the American troops bombed the VC supply lines using napalm and Agent Orange. Again, this is really controversial. Napalm is this jellied gasoline that explodes on contact. So it was dropped by these airplanes during the Vietnam War uh, to really act as a defoliant, to clear out the forest so that the VC could not hide in the forest. However, if there were civilians or villages in the forest, then it was dropped on civilian population. Agent Orange was something very similar that acts as this defoliant that would strip the leaves, um, the trees and the shrubs away so that you couldn't hide in the forest. Again, a lot of civilians were impacted by this. It destroyed groundwater, um, and uh, some Vietnamese were known to have uh, women gave birth with birth defects because of it. So uh, here you see um, a napalm attack, 
dropping it, causing a massive explosion. And then this real famous image um, was taken uh, when it was dropped on on a village um, and the children had to take off their clothes. They're screaming because it is burning their skin. So let's talk about this Ho Chi Minh Trail. So this is a trail that ran from North Vietnam all the way uh, to South Vietnam. So you could start here. And again, it more than likely started from China, who was giving supplies to the North Vietnamese. Uh, then Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese built these elaborate trails through Laos, through Cambodia, and the supplies would go throughout the South. Sometimes they would cross the border, but a lot of times they would use Laos and Cambodia in order to sneak supplies in. And this is something that was really devastating for all individuals involved. The Laotians and the Cambodians didn't want to be involved in this war. However, the North Vietnamese knew that if they smuggled the supplies in through Laos and through Cambodia and the Americans bombed the supply lines, it was America that was perceived as the bad guy. So we're dragging in um, North Vietnam and America's dragging in uh, these Laos and Cambodia, these peaceful countries or relatively peaceful to us um, in our war. But if we, the only way we can crush the VC is if we destroy these supply lines. So the trail transverse through forests, sometimes they're above ground, sometimes they're underground. Um, VC built these big underground tunnels where they would hide during the day. Uh, so a lot was orchestrated just logistically from the VC in order to win this war. So America ended up dropping bombs over Laos and Cambodia, these countries that we are not at war against in order to destroy the tail, the trail. And that's a really good topic for conversation. Like is all fair in war? Um, how long should war last? Um, should Laos and Cambodia, should they have chosen a side? are all good questions. So um, here you see some images of people um, taking supplies. So um, hopefully you could get to this point that we do have a growing anti-war movement at this time uh, for a few reasons. One, it's fairly obvious that the government is lying to the media and the American public about the war, specifically because uh, the government is incredibly happy and chipper about the war. Uh, the war is going well, the enemy is on a retreat, and then they see images from you know, uh, napalm attacks and they hear about VC attacks and they're confused about you know, what the veterans are coming home saying and what the video cameras and the journalists are reporting. There's this credibility gap between the media and the White House where people really don't know what to believe, but they are seeing images and hearing from veterans about the war. And it really dramatically differs than what uh, the government is saying. This really leads to a teaching movement that begins in 1965 where you have uh, college professors um, extended using the radio uh, to project throughout campus, throughout multiple campuses, in order to just increase awareness about the war and kind of discuss, well, what actually is happening because they feel like they're not getting a correct answer from the media, or maybe they're not getting a correct answer from their government, and they really want to get to the bottom of it. So here's an example of this credibility gap that we have here. So this is from the Pentagon Papers, um, and we have, at the time, July 1965, the Viet Cong were con continuing to expand their control in rural areas. So again, Viet Cong is continuing to expand and had succeeded in isolating several provincial or small districts and towns from the bulk of the rural population. Their apparent willingness to accept large casualties and offensive engagements indicated the manpower shortage did not currently exist. So here we have in this secret CIA document that the VC is going strong. Meanwhile, General Miss Westmoreland at a speech in public says, I am absolutely certain that whereas in 1965, the enemy was winning, today he is certainly losing. We are making progress. We know you want honorable and early transition to the fourth and last phase. So do your sons and so do I. It lies within our grasp that enemy's hopes are bankrupt. So we have this idea where you know, he had said, although this is in 1967, he had said in 1965, oh, their backs are against the wall. 
we're going to win. And then in 66, we're going to win. And in 67, we're going to win. Spoiler alert, we're not done until 1973. And so... Um, this really comes to a head uh, with the American public who, again, look at the nose. Now Johnson's nose is not just a symbol for him, but also for po Pinocchio. And you see this scar. He's pointing to the scar on his belly, and it's the shape of Vietnam. Basically, it's his lies have basically scarred him. And you have, you know, get the hell a copters out of Vietnam. Uh, you have chance uh, against the White House. This is actually, you can see, this is where the uh, Lincoln Memorial is in Washington, DC. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? It's pretty catchy, uh, but definitely if you're Johnson, that's not something that you wanna hear on a daily basis. So this anti-war movement, it expands with SDS, which is the Students for Democratic Society. Uh, they organized a march on Washington with 20,000 people in 1965, definitely not the 250,000 that King brought two years before, uh, but it's a large movement. Uh, and this is televised and photographed all over the place. So people are watching the news and they're thinking that this anti-war demonstration anti-war movement is incredibly large and it is large but uh, we do have this silent majority that we'll get to with the nixon administration the silent majority of americans who are not these you know draft dodging burning draft cards sticking flowers into guns you know hell no don't go um people uh, but there is a lot of anger um in the population at this time. Number one, they feel like there's an unfair draft process, right? If you're rich enough to go to college, if you're rich enough to get the right doctor, you can dodge the draft. Uh, you also have a disproportionate number of African Americans who are fighting in the military and dying in the military. And this is when a lot of civil rights activists like Martin Luther King Jr. are going to speak out against the war because he sees the war as something that's taking away from the great society, but also leading to a lot of um, deaths of the African-American people. Uh, also, there's this widespread corruption in South Vietnam. Nobody knows who the enemy quite is. Uh, you have a ton of people who are dodging the draft, a lot of people who are arrested for not going to the draft. And something that really upset a lot of these young people is that they got called to fight in the war at 18, 19, and 20, but they don't have the right to vote until they're 21. So that also becomes a large issue uh, for the younger population, these uh, baby boomers. So you can see here uh, the escalation of troops. So uh, troop escalation, boop, and it's really peaking here in 1968, and then it starts to go down. As Ed mentioned, we're not really all the way out until 1973. Um, Nixon is going to become president here, um, and he does do a gradual drawdown, but it does take a while. So this right here, this draw up, represents the escalation of troop uh, deployment, despite the fact that Johnson had said publicly that he seeks no wider war. Again, this leads to the credibility gap. And also see here the percentage of people against US involvement in the war. It was incredibly small when we started the war. And then it gradually ticks up, especially then when we get into the Johnson, uh, sorry, the Nixon administration. So by 1968, at this peak here, we have 536,000 troops in Vietnam, 16,000 deaths. By the end of the war, we're gonna have about 58,000 deaths. So it's going to be really devastating for a generation of people. Uh, a big turning point in the Johnson administration when it comes to Vietnam is the Tet Offensive. This happens during the Vietnamese New Year, and there was supposed to be a ceasefire, but it did not happen. The VC and the NVA launched surprise attacks on American air bases, even against an American embassy in Saigon. And their whole goal is to get these secret VC uh, to join the out VC, right? The, the VC who was part of this campaign with the NBA thought that there was a whole bunch of anti-American uh, people in South Vietnam that uh, if they launched this big massive Tet offensive, then all of these you know, secret anti-Americans would come out of hiding and join them. But that didn't happen. In fact, the VC did not gain any additional support. They didn't have any tactical advantage or any strategic advantage at this point. 
However, this was a big psychological defeat for America and the Johnson administration. Once again, General Westmoreland in the year before had said, oh, the enemy at its backs, like we're going to win any day now. Johnson administration had told the country, you know, we're on the verge of winning. So the big question is, how could an enemy on the verge of defeat launch such a full scale attack? And this is something that, again, it's part of this credibility um, gap. And you see here, again, these images of such destruction throughout South Vietnam. And again, despite the fact that we did not lose this battle, the war is still not over. And America can't really understand then why it's going to continue. Uh, shortly after that, Johnson says, peace out, my friends. I am not going to be your president anymore, or at least I'm not going to run again. I have concluded that I should not permit the presidency to become involved in the partisan divisions that are developing in this political year. Basically talking about Tet and Vietnam, and I will not accept nor seek another term as your president. And this is really demoralizing for the American people. I mean, being president is a really hard job. I can't imagine anyone who want to do it. But if you're there and you could run again and you say, nope, I, this country is a lost cause and I'm not going to be part of it. Again, really demoralizing for the American people. We're in the middle of peace talks at this time. And that, I'm going to go back here. Uh, we're in the middle of peace talks at this time. And so a lot of Americans are incredibly curious. How are the peace talks going to progress if Johnson's not there? Um, who is going to resume the peace talks? Uh, and Nixon is going to take use these peace talks to his advantage, which we'll talk about in the next presentation. Uh, and this is where we continue with this kind of fight with you know, the media and, and politicians, this credibility gap. Uh, here we have Walter Cronkite uh, with CBS Evening News. Uh, an incredibly respected journalist um, at this time. And he says, what the hell is going on? I thought we were winning this war. Again, if we're winning this war, how could Tet happen and how come the war's not over now? Uh, Eugene McCarthy was running, he was a senator, uh, running for president in the election of 1968. And he says, in 1963, we were told that we were winning the war. In 64, we were told we were winning the war. In 64, we were told the corner was being turned. In 65, we were told the enemy was being brought to its knees. In 66 and 67, and now again in 1968, we are. Uh, we hear the same hollow cl claims of programs and victory. Only a few months ago, we were told that 65% of the population was secure. And now we know that even the American embassy is not secure. So um, who's telling the truth and who who's lying. Again, once the Pentagon Papers, these secret CIA documents, once they're leaked uh, in about, I think it's four years from now, uh, we're going to find out that the government was definitely not being incredibly honest um, in Viet with what was happening in Vietnam. So 1968 is just this ultimate year of chaos. And it starts with Tet on January 30th. And then, like I had mentioned before, Johnson announces that he's not going to seek another term. Shortly after that, just a few days later, Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated. Uh, right after that, Robert Kennedy is assassinated. And Robert Kennedy was a, a Democrat who was going to run or currently running in the 1968 election uh, for president. Uh, Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy, who had the quote just before, uh, were running on the Democratic ticket. When Kennedy is assassinated, the Democrats are just left in shambles. They really have no idea what direction to go. Uh, you have most of the Democrats are doves, uh, which they want it in the war. Uh, but uh, with Kennedy's assassination, nobody's quite sure who is going to uh, be on the Democratic ticket. And so because of this, you have massive violent protests outside of Democratic convention. Um, in Chicago, uh, Mayor Daley had called in twice as many police and military police to patrol the protesters. I think 10,000 protesters and 20,000 police officers, which just led to a really bad situation, as you can see in this image here. So it really just sews up the end of Johnson's administration as being incredibly chaotic. Uh, and this is what leads us to the election of 1968. We have Hubert Humphrey here, who's the Democrat. He was Johnson's vice president and he wants to unify the country and basically end the war. Now, we know now 
um, with documents that have been released because you know, this was decades ago, uh, that Johnson was incredibly close to ending the war in Vietnam, incredibly close. Uh, peace talks were um, in negotiation. We were just going to have a situation where we would just kind of just withdraw. Um, Nixon over here, who was a tricky individual, uh, had a lot of local experience. He was uh, on a HUAC committee in the 1940s. He was Eisenhower's vice president in the 1950s. Um, he is the Republican running against Hubert Humphrey, who is, he is incredibly unpopular because he's Johnson's vice president and Johnson's incredibly unpopular. So Nixon um, does, uh, you know, get with his contacts um, and sabotages the peace talks and basically goes to uh, Vietnam, South Vietnam, and says, don't sign anything, don't agree to anything, wait for me to become president, and I'll get you a better deal. Um, and this probably was part of his secret plan. Um, when he runs as president, he says, oh, I have the secret plan to bring peace and honor in Vietnam. I'll let you know when I get inaugurated. Um, he did win. Uh, it was really close. 510,000 popular votes was the difference. Uh, George Wallace does run. Um, he is that uh, governor from Alabama who runs on a third party uh, platform purely about states' rights, um, civil rights, or against civil rights, and purely segregationist. So uh, Nixon wins. Here is the election map. Uh, you see here he does have uh, quite a large electoral victory, 56% uh, electoral victory, um, but a really, really short margin when it comes to the popular vote, 43.2 versus 42.6. Again, it's that silent majority that he appeals to. Everyone's not against the war. Um, everyone's not a hippie. Everyone's not you know, sticking flowers in people's uh, guns. So next time when we cover the Nixon administration, what was Nixon's secret plan that he promised to reveal on Inauguration Day? Did Nixon bring peace and honor to Vietnam? And how was he so tricky?